I'm Tom Sadler, Principal Software Engineer at the BBC. Um, as you see, I've been kind of facilitating today. Um, my job's focused on industry engagement, open source and inner source. Um, I'm, connect I'm attached to the connected TV teams, um, hence why we've been you know, talking about connected TV today. Um, but before this current uh, kind of open source industry engagement role, um, I've been working with connected TV devices for nearly 11 years. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot's changed in that time. Uh, it's been really great to hear from Chris and Mo today uh, and just see how uh, how far we've come in terms of you know, front end rendering for, for connected TV devices. And, you know, we can do things, um, you know, we can do much more powerful front end experiences than, than we could when I started in, in TV apps, certainly. So uh, I'm going to talk um, a bit about open source in general and kind of uh, open source at BBC. I'm going to talk about TAL, which was our um, now deprecated open source framework for developing TV apps. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, yeah what what connected TV open source projects we've currently got going, um, and also what we want to open source, um, and also explore some of the some of the blockers we've been having in terms of actually open sourcing it, um, which uh, hopefully will be interesting just from a general open source point of view, um, as well as yeah um, seeing a little bit what what kind of things we might be might be open sourcing um, and also this gives me gives an opportunity for um, anyone uh, watching today um, you know let us know what libraries sound interesting to you um, and also yeah a, a lot of this is going to be you know tv specific like what there's a lot of interesting tv specific problems um, that our open source libraries and our closed source libraries are, are trying to solve um, but yeah coming back to um, open source at the BBC in general, um, it's it's something that we we do believe in. Um, certainly, I think as most tech companies do these days, um, most of our software is built on top of open source frameworks. Um, but we're also conscious, you know, it's not it shouldn't be a one way street. Um, we do uh, we do have. Uh, a bunch of open source projects. Um, this is our open source website. If you want to find out more about things that are going on, um, we don't open source everything. Um, I know some kind of public sector places uh, do have the kind of public money, public code. Um, we we find that there are um, kind of other arguments for sometimes having stuff closed source as well. Um, so we're yeah we're not on the path to kind of open source everything but we do want to open source what we can and i'll go into some of the motivations uh in a minute but yeah um shout out to our r d department um r d especially are really good at getting involved in open source um especially with their work contributing to both broadcast standards and web standards and um, yeah, BBC Open Source has been a thing for a long time. This was BBC Code UK slash Open Source back in 2005. Um, so yeah, um, it's uh, it's always been part of the BBC. But yeah, specifically, like what um, what does what does Open Source give to us? Like what you know, why should we care? Um, there's the strategic element, you know, there are reasons to open source things, um, you know, to to help drive our strategy in one way or another. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about TAL because that was a lot of the motivation for open sourcing TAL. Um, partnerships, so working with other companies, um, it's much easier you know, rather than having to worry about contracts and, and things like that. If we can work in the open source, then partnerships are much easier, um, especially R&D do a lot of this. I'm not sure there's so many examples of kind of open source partnerships in our audience facing services, but certainly R&D are doing this a lot. Recruitment and retention. Um, so, you know, um, being active in open source um, kind of enhances a company's reputation we find um, people are more interested in in working for us if we have an open source presence uh, and retention as well um, you know uh, giving people the opportunity to get involved with things outside of their um, you know outside of just working with BBC colleagues working in open source means we can work with people all over the world 
Um, public remit, so yeah, covered this a little bit. Um, you know, it, it makes sense that we should be um, giving value back to the public because that's where our money comes from. Um, and as I say, there are, um, you know, the interest, interesting commercial reasons why we don't open source everything. But um, certainly this is a good justification where, um, where there are opportunities to open source projects. Uh, contributing back as well, so not only contributing back our code, but it's important to contribute to your dependencies. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of uh, pressure on certain open source projects, um, a lot of reliance on certain open source projects, and you know, if they're if those projects are really key to your to your services that you're providing, then contributing back and getting involved in those communities um, is only going to benefit everyone, especially yourself, because you're dependent on this. Um, and the other reason that's the other thing that's interesting about open source is um, it did help us with internal collaboration. So we found that having open source BBC projects would actually get BBC colleagues um, from different departments working together. Um, you know, over the past few years, we've also been looking at inner source um, and kind of because of this because of this ob observation we had where open source projects were getting internal collaboration, we we kind of went down the inner source path and, and learned about that and got uh, got involved in the inner source commons community as well. So coming back to TV, uh, Tau, um, so th this was the first project that I worked on when I first joined uh, the BBC. Um, it was already open source. Um, and as I say, it, uh, in terms of the strategy, um, we, we were at the time uh, working towards um, building, a t building a single TV app or a single, a single iPlayer for TVs. Um, before Tau, we had a uh, big fragmentation. We had, I think, uh, it was before my time, but sort of seven or eight different versions of iPlayer to target seven or eight different platforms. So we felt that by working on this kind of web standard-based way of building TV apps in the open, it would encourage um, it would encourage other TV app developers to also follow the same web standards um, and also get manufacturers involved in the process as well. So. Yeah, so back in sort of 2012 uh, or 2013, I uh, can't remember exactly when the news app was released. Um, but yeah, we had this uh, we had this structure of three different apps all built on top of Tau. Um, you know, uh, we don't have a separate news and support app these days, but um, yeah, in the kind of early days of Tau, um, we were able to have three different apps um, on a common framework and uh, targeting a multitude of devices. Um, and we've heard, um, you know, similar problems still exist today, you know, uh, Mo talking about React Native and, and targeting that device fragmentation. Um, and yeah, um, this is kind of, uh, this is kind of our, our way of going. Um, our strategy is still web apps, um, you know, um, maybe we might go native at some point in the future, but um, or partially native. But certainly for now, like having uh, having web standards and being able to to build on them and build a single web app for most devices, um, you know, gives us that um, gives us that reusability, reduces waste, all that good stuff. So yeah, Tal solved a lot of these problems for us. It provided abstractions around um, rendering, so. You know, nowhere near as powerful as the other rendering solutions we've talked about today. But um, you know, back in 2012, just having uh, having a framework that provided a shadow DOM, uh, carousels, and you know, UI building blocks like that was really useful. Um, it was very, very limited. Um, you know, it's mostly just divs and spans um, because the, the the kind of webs the web standards support back then was not as good as it was today so using a very limited subset of html uh, and providing abstraction to do that um was yeah was the way to go to get um so that the the people working on the on iplay and using sport didn't have to worry quite so much about tv compatibility uh, also provided abstractions for you know, playback interacting with the broadcast on hbb 
uh, TV devices, um, you know, mapping keys, um, and also having that kind of uh, shadow DOM rendering layer gave us um, a way of uh, navigating around using, um, you know, five point nav up, down, left, right, and OK. Um, again, uh, it's been talked about a little bit already today. So yeah, um, it was great at the time, but as time went on, um, we kind of we started to see TVs evolving in terms of how good they were at supporting web standards. Um, we started to see performance issues, um, limitations around um, you know being able to build um, the, the user uh, the user facing features that product wanted us to. You know, it was it either slowed us down or made things very difficult um you know web frameworks had gone miles ahead of anything like this and uh, tv devices were starting to be able to support it so we start to move away from tal um, other problems uh, were things like accessibility as i say you know there's no semantic web there wasn't any semantic web going on with tal it was all just divs and spans for the most part so yeah um we we gradually moved away from tal um and uh, eventually decommissioned it fully um we're we are nearly off tal actually at least for iPlayer um but yeah it's been a kind of gradual refactor um but yeah most of our um most of our user experiences were built using uh, modern web rendering frameworks uh, rather than tal and that gave us yeah better development better user experiences better accessibility all that stuff um but tal you know, Tal still had some value. Um, there were certain elements of Tal that we wanted to retain, um, kind of uh, even though we're moving to uh, more standard um, web frameworks for rendering uh, playback. And again, uh, this has come up in a couple of the, the questions and answers today. Um, but we retained a lot of Tal's um, playback logic. Um, so Big Screen Player is one of our uh, current uh, open source offerings. Um, the the kind of interest, well, there's quite a few interesting things that it does, but um, one of the interesting things is it uh, provides that abstraction layer around different playback strategies. So we have um, support for HTML5 video, kind of uh, native HTML5, as well as media source extensions using the Dash JS library. But we also have, um, so some, we still have iPlayer on sort of 2014, 2013 devices. Um, and they use, or some of them use, um, a kind of pre-HTML5 way of doing playback called CEHTML. So we still actually support that thanks to this abstraction layer. And um, we also have uh, a couple of different Samsung specific strategies for 2014, 2015 devices. Um, and this was actually a great example of open source where Samsung contributed those 2014, 2015 strategies um, so that we can, you know, we have uh, live seeking still available on, on uh, devices 10 years old thanks to that contribution from Samsung. Um, it's also got things like failover logic, subtitles via IMSC, um, fake seeking as we call it, so for, for older devices that don't support live seeking um, but do support starting a stream from a particular point in time, you can kind of, it. Um, so if you seek on those devices it actually tears down the video and restarts it um, with the seek point you've tried to get to uh, and on-screen debugging um, from from speaking to people, um, this this may not necessarily be suitable for other people to use or other companies to use. Um, I'm not sure how many people are supporting those kind of long tail 2013, 2014 devices. Um, and there's also things like um, things like ad insertion we don't support because we don't <laughs> we don't have adverts. Um, but it's still yeah it's still out there. Um, if it's something that might be of interest and it does is good to get device manufacturers involved as well. Uh, another piece of open source that we uh, that we still have and support is Elrod Spatial. Uh, and uh, again, Mo was talking about Elrod. So um, Spatial Elrod is actually uh, a newer version that uses um, kind of Cartesian positioning of the DOM elements to do the navigation rather than a navigation tree, which the original Elrod used. Um, but 
yeah um again interesting tv specific problem uh, that is five point navigation um melanite um so yeah we don't don't have a fancy logo for melanite but this is um this is a library we have for taking a device user agent and mapping it to a brand and model um so you can use this and have your own definitions of what user agent strings map to what brand and model segregation you want to have um we do have a snapshot of data um it does tend to be a couple of years out of date um because uh, we uh, we don't currently have a mechanism to um share that user agent data um w without uh, introducing risks around ndas and things like that um but yeah that that snapshot of data is there if you did want to use this to um provide different experiences in your web app uh, based on based on the user agent um i guess part of that as well is uh, configs so we don't have open source configs um but uh if we do manage to open source configs in the future then um that would be that brand and model mapping and the configs would include um you know what different strategies you can use what does that device support should you have animation disabled for performance reasons all that kind of stuff so uh in terms of what we want to open source next um we um we are slightly blocked at the moment to open source more because um as we kind of moved away from tal uh, and pulled out various libraries to build tv apps on top of rather than a, a single big framework um we put all of these libraries into a monorepo so it's a rush js uh, monorepo um, other monorepo tools are available that's just the one that uh, we found works for us but yeah um having having the packages managed in a monorepo um gives us a lot of benefits um just around dependency management you know when you've got um i think it's um i think it's something like 60 packages we've got uh, and multiple applications having it all in a monorepo makes dependency management much easier whether that's diamond dependencies uh, tickets where you are working on uh, you're working on multiple packages at once you don't need to have like you don't need to bump and release five different versions of five different libraries and, and integrate them you can all do it in a single pull request um and it also keeps um our various apps in line um so that we're not kind of we don't have any version clashes or anything like that um so yeah so we have um a load of different apps in our monorepo uh, we have some tests that we use for certifying devices um we have connected bridge which is our kind of broadcast red button um html application um bbc sounds uh tap which is actually iplayer for historic reasons i won't go into today um, and telly which is our kind of uh post tal um that is uh is getting rolled out currently um so uh yeah uh having all these having all these apps that use all the different packages so this isn't a full list of packages we have yeah 68 it was 68 packages um so there's yeah having all those packages all those different apps which you know as we roll out telly that list of apps will go down a little bit um but uh it's still it's still a lot of dependencies with a lot with quite a few consumers having it all in a monorepo makes it really easy to to maintain and um, keep everything up to date uh, and also as i say work across different packages so there's loads of benefits and it really helps us with what we're trying to do in terms of our you know delivering on product features but this makes open source difficult um as you can imagine we can't simply open source our entire tv client monorepo um but if we start pulling out open source candidate packages out of the monorepo then we start to lose the benefits so um yeah so we're uh, uh we're looking to play some work to to um start mirroring out some of the packages um but you know priorities and everything um it's difficult to uh difficult to invest the time to do that but it is something we're, we're hoping to do um you know once we um once telly's been released and 
Um, and once we have a, a clear idea of what libraries we want to open source. So, yeah, so what kind of packages do we want to open source from our monorepo? Um, configs, I'll talk a bit about configs. Um, again, this is, um, you know, there's kind of um, manufacturer relationships we need to be cognizant of. So this isn't particularly straightforward, but if we were able to, um, if we were able to open source configs alongside the, the kind of user agent data I was talking about before, then that would uh, enable us to share uh, how we provide different experiences for different uh, TV brand and models. Uh, we have a library called Scrollinator. This is probably quite a good one, actually. Um, so this um, this kind of enables us to do, um, kind of, I suppose it's like fake scrolling, because rather than kind of browser scrolling, you're moving the UI elements around the screen uh, using top left styling. But we find this quite useful um, because it, uh, I don't think I don't think we found anything in Preact that would support that because I guess again it's kind of a TV specific thing. That's kind of what we're looking for with our open source. Like what what candidates are there that are interesting TV specific problems? Uh, key mapping, um, yeah. Again, I know uh, Mo covered this a little bit and how that's handled in React Native, um, but again, that would be it's a pretty small thing it's something tal provided but that might be an interesting thing to open source as well um broadcast again this wouldn't be a huge module but if people are still you know doing the the hybrid broadcast broadband thing um interacting with the broadcast you know seeing what channel is on in the background maybe even actually having broadcast rendered um behind some html uh, user experience. Um, it's not something we have in our products currently, but um, yeah, when we're, I suppose actually, you know, we do with with the red button connected bridge that I've talked about before. So again, something quite small, but something quite interesting. Um, but also uh, an example app kind of pulling these things together, you know, uh, pulling together the big screen player, uh, Elrod Spatial, and any of these we managed to open source as well. Um, I think one of the interesting things with this is it will we could also include um, how we handle um, how we handle older devices and their lack of support for certain um, web APIs. Um, so whether that's transpilation, whether that's polyfills, um, we don't we we don't have like a, a polyfills library per se, uh, at least not not for telly. Um, so I think a good way of sharing that would be. Uh, via an example app and or documentation. So yeah, I wanted to share that with you today. Um, so if any of this is is of interest, please do reach out and um, that will yeah help us target what to open source first. Um, as I say, interesting challenges um, that we've had to make trade-offs against. Um, but um, yeah, the better understanding we have of what is useful for the wider community, um, the more we can um, yeah, the, the more we can move towards open sourcing more things. Well, that was everything for me. Thank you very much.